And it's now my privilege to invite our hosts here today and uh, Elizabeth Tillich to come out, or Liz, as you prefer to be called, um, to now um, be the third speaker around advocacy. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, hmm. There we go. Okay, got it. <laughs> well, good afternoon, everyone. And um, what an act to follow as well. Um, that, um, that movie was truly inspirational and really gave me pause to think. My topic today is continuing the theme and I'm talking about advocacy. Advocacy, I'm advocating for this important human right, the right of self-determination, a right that we all have. Advocating for the need to have the conversation so that aged care providers are going to be able to support ageing persons to make informed choices, exercise their independence and take risks. But also a conversation how we in turn support the providers in undertaking this exercise of balancing the dignity of risk and duty of care. And from my perspective, this starts with the board. As we all know, the board's role and senior management and the executive team play a really important part in setting the tone from the top. The board's responsible for setting the governance framework for the organisation, the way in which decisions are made throughout the organisation. They play a pivotal role in setting the risk management framework for the organisation, deciding upon the organisation's risk appetite and how they're going to deal with risks as and when they arise, what are their mitigation measures. Of course, the role in setting strategy and leading in how that's going to be implemented. And because they uh, play the important part in setting the governance framework, that then dictates how policies and procedures which determine day-to-day -day actions of the frontline staff, how they come to fruition. Arising out of all of this um, creates the culture of the organisation, the shared beliefs and values that everyone shares, but also the way that I like to think about culture is what do people do when no one's looking? What actions do they take then? I think that's a really important determiner of culture. So if it's the board and senior management team's responsibility to set this governance framework and to determine how the day-to-day -day actions are going to be carried out in their organisation, how do boards and leadership teams determine how to navigate the legal landscape and how do they determine how they're going to balance this dignity of risk and the duty of care and actually come to a decision. And my view that this is a collaboration exercise. It's a co-design. Not one person or what one organisation is going to have all the answers. And today and other conversations are the beginning of that journey. <coughs> so what does the legal landscape look like? Well, Anthony did touch on this as well in terms of the new single aged care quality framework and the standards that came in on 1 July and also the Charter of Aged Care Rights. Yes, picking up themes from years gone by, um, but now restated in their form. The most important standard, standard one, it actually says in the standards that this is the one that underpins all the others. And this is, of course, goes directly to what we're talking about today, dignity and choice of clients or residents. And what does it state as the outcome that's expected? That the resident is treated with dignity and respect, they can maintain their identity can make informed choices about their care and services and live the life that they choose. And what's expected of organisations? So the organisations, the aged care providers, need to support their clients, their residents, to exercise this independence choice, um, to exercise their choice and in independence, but also importantly, to respect their privacy. And one of the requirements is stated that each consumer is supported to take risks to enable them to live the best life that they can. This standard is supported by the Charter of Aged Care Rights, which again refers to a consumer having the right to be treated with dignity and respect, to live their, um, to have control over and make choices about their care, including where those choices involve personal risk, to have their independence and to have their personal privacy respected. So standard one, and this charter clearly set out the expected standard regarding supporting consumer choice and independence. And I think a duty for the provider to provide an environment 
to support the dignity of risk. It also clearly focuses on the right of privacy of the resident and to ensure that it's protected, which does go further than what we're used to in the, with the Privacy Act and just ensuring that personal information is protected. This is actually the right of privacy of the individual and to respect their wishes about information about them and to whom that should be disclosed to. And therefore, when considering some of these issues, when we get to the um, real interplay where dignity of risk and duty of care are but, and we have those conversations with the, the client and the resident, usually there are a lot more people involved in that conversation so that everyone can understand what decisions are actually being made, including families, other allied health providers, staff, etc. So um, bearing in mind the right to privacy and navigating those conversations will be important as well. So we have on the one side this expectation and duty, I say, of facilitating and supporting an environment for dignity of risk. But as we've also been talking about in the other presentations, we've got the common law duty of care. And I'm focusing at it from the, from the legal duty of care, putting to one side the professional obligations of duty of care and, and the health um, requirements, etc bringing it back down to what is the essence of the legal duty of care. And it's one which says, is a legal duty to take reasonable care not to cause harm or injury to another person that could be reasonably foreseen. So what I want you to focus in that definition is on the word reasonable. The expectation that the duty of care is to take reasonable steps to mitigate, minimise harm or injury. The duty is not to eliminate all risk. So I think that's important for the context and discussions that we will be having. And I understand that the concept can seem nebulous and vague um, and that organisations, quite rightly from an organisational protection and governance, can be quite conservative and therefore err on the side of caution of not accepting some risks. And of course, in every particular circumstance, it'll be a question of fact and degree as to which way we should consider risk and which way the pendulum swing, swings. And to discharge the duty first requires, as Anthony mentioned, the actual identification of the risk, because we need to know what we're actually talking about. And I think that's a really important part of the process, because I think a lot of the time people assume there are risks, but actually haven't done the analysis of, for this particular person, in their particular situation, what are the risks we're actually talking about? So let's identify those. Can we mitigate or manage them? Um, can we support the person to do things in a different way? Um, what information can we provide? And of course, in this context of duty of care, the organisation doesn't just have the duty to that individual client or resident. It's in the context where there's actually a duty to all residents in the particular nursing home, and also the duty to staff and the workforce. And I think this is a really important part of the puzzle because of course you've got all your occupational health and safety laws to ensure that there's a safe working environment and that means having a regard to how the workforce are going to interact with considering this issue of supporting their um, residents and clients in exercising their independence choice and the dignity of risk. So let's consider that in some more detail. So I, I think clearly there is a duty and a responsibility for providers um, to ensure they support an environment um, that allows dignity of risk. And we could argue that this has already, already existed or always has existed as a human right in any event. But there is a continuum of risk, um, choice and liability. And if we look at one end of the continuum, the continuum of self-determination, the dignity of risk, where an individual has a freedom to make their own decisions without care or responsibility for themselves or for others. That's at one extreme. Then we have the other extreme of duty of care where the organisation says, um, we don't understand all the risks. We're, we're really concerned about it. We don't think the individual will make the right decision. So we're going to eliminate all risks and we're going to make the decisions for them. So we have the, we have the two extremes. Where really I think we need to coalesce in the middle and try and work out how we can match these two duties together and, and shift and change as different circumstances arise. And I think historically, um, organisations, and we've heard particularly in the health profession, have sat 
uh, closer to ensuring that duty of care is absolutely first and foremost upheld um, because um, of the environment, um, how people were trained, but also because people aren't necessarily equipped with all the skills to understand about risk and how else can we manage them. It's a bit scary, so we won't go there. But also it's a very human perspective and a human condition because as individuals, we all come with our own risk appetite and we're all very judgmental and we will judge other people making choices. And if we can't understand why a certain person is making a choice, it doesn't accord with us, it seems too risky, then we, we pass judgment and in a healthcare context, we probably say, no, actually, that just seems too risky because I wouldn't do it. And it goes back to the, the good and bad um, discussion that you were talking about in terms of decisions. But with the consumer-centred care framework and world that we're now living in, I think the framework for making decisions is actually changing. I think now we actually need to start with the assumption that the individual, the client, the resident, has the right to make their own choices. And then we consider the risk. And then we consider how do we support them in making that decision how do we provide information to them so they can better understand the nature of the risks? Is there a different way? Um, and have the conversation framed in that way. Because I think historically, we've come at it from the other perspective. There's too much risk, I don't understand, so I'm just gonna say no, um, rather than having the conversation. And I guess that's what today and advocacy is all about. How do we open up these conversations, provi provide a platform so that it's safe to have these conversations and to actually explore and start to come up with some of these solutions. Um, and I'm not saying that it's going to be easy, I think it's definitely a journey, but I think with that mind shift of how even to have the conversation, then that goes a long way to engaging with the uh, um, clients and residents. And that's why I see the actual most important part of this <laughs> is culture. Because if an organisation doesn't actually allow those conversations to happen, for people to test, inquire, and feel safe to try things differently, then actually things will never change. So for me, a key part of this is engaging the workforce and really providing the training support and skills and tools that frontline staff will actually need to be able to have to even have these conversations. And I think when you think about um, the abuttal of dignity of risk and duty of care, where I actually see one of the greatest areas for risk um, in the short term is actually how staff are going to feel about it. How stressed and concerned are they going to feel when they've started to allow people to make their individual choices, which have some risk, which might ultimately lead to a death. Whereas the eliminate all risk, we've, we did all we could, or well, at least that followed our training and we did our best, but now if we're actually allowing someone else to make the decision, which we know is risky and we wouldn't do it, and it does go wrong, then there will be some stress and concern for staff. So I think um, when organisations are starting to think about this and navigate this, then that training and support piece for staff will be really important. Um, and because I think it comes down to culture, that's why I think boards and senior management play such an important part in really leading and framing this discussion and setting the tone so that it's okay to start to think about doing things differently. And um, I know when I go to um, strategy workshops and the facilitator normally says, no one is allowed to say no. Um, if someone's throwing in an idea, um, you can say yes and. <laughs> so yes, I hear you, but and this is what else we need to think about. And how about we think about an alternative way? So it's reframing the conversation and, and allowing it to actually occur. And I think in reframing the conversation, I don't think we're compromising on the duty of care either, because you still need to manage risk and harm to others. I think it's a recognition that an ageing person with capacity to make an informed choice, to accept risk that may have some harmful consequences, if all care has been taken to minimise that risk, warn them, inform them of the specific um, risks involved, they can still exercise and make that choice and accept the risk as an individual, provided they're not negatively impacting upon others, because that's obviously the balance. And that's where you will have some situations where actually what an individual wants to do, smoke in the dining room, 
is harmful to others. So then you have to explain to them, actually, that's not acceptable, let's find a different pathway. I also think that because you have this in the standards, in the Charter of Rights, as a human right, the dignity of risk and the expectation that organisations are going to facilitate the environment to support an individual's choice, um, that when you consider duty of care from a legal perspective, it will be informed by your other duty. So I don't think a court's going to say, oh, well, you had your duty of care over here, didn't take a reasonable, didn't, didn't consider this, uh, didn't take reasonable steps, didn't consider this foreseeable risk um, because you went down a different pathway. I think, and, and part of the process in navigating this whole discussion is actually lining them up side by side. So an individual wants to make a choice, does that impact upon others? What are the risks? What can we put in place? What's reasonable? And if we've done that, we've met our duty of care, and we've allowed them to exercise some choice. And in fact, this is what standard one talks about as well. So it says that where, where consumer choice is mentioned in the standards, there may be situations where consumers will not have an unlimited choice, including where their choices negatively impact upon others. This is an important consideration, as obviously the provider needs to manage risks and its duty to other clients and its workforce. So what is expected of a provider in this situation is to take reasonable steps to find alternatives to meet the needs of the resident. So it's not just to say no, it's too risky, it impacts everyone else. What else can we do? Yes and. The standard is focused on how, do, how does the organisation demonstrate that it does support consumer choice? How does it make sure that the workforce does not limit choice because of their own individual judgement? And how do they manage issues of consent, which obviously will be a critical component of this and matters that you deal with day to day anyway? How do they deal with differences of opinion with families? Again, something that you also deal with. And how does the provider ultimately demonstrate what agreement is reached, setting out um, how they were able to meet a consumer choice? So what's the process of communication and information sharing? And really, um, that's what I also wanted just to leave you with as well, is some of those practical considerations for how to start framing and considering, considering this discussion. Obviously, the risk management framework, which underpins how the organisation deals with risk and assesses risk, will be a really important component because um, it overlays everything else. And from there, the policies and procedures are drawn. So that's where the board and the senior management and leadership team have a really important part to play in really assessing for our organisation how we're going to have this conversation about risk and balancing the dignity of risk and our duty of care. That will inform our policies and procedures, which of course you will require anyway to just demonstrate compliance with the standards. As I said, training and support, critical for staff so that they feel supported in this approach, they have the necessary skills, tools to even have these conversations, to facilitate the decision making, to consider innovative and different solutions, communication with staff, with residents, with families, with other stakeholders. There will be a need of collaboration, bearing in mind respecting the privacy of the client and resident. And ultimately, if a resident in their lifestyle choice um, wants to exercise their own independent judgment and make a choice that does involve risk, um, then part of the provider's duty is to assist them in that decision-making process. So do they have all the necessary information so they understand what, uh, what the risk is that they're deciding to undertake? Have you been specific about the nature of that risk? Have we put in other measures to help mitigate or minimise? And ultimately, can they consent to this? Do they have capacity as well? And finally, as with everything, documentation. The process about how you get to decisions is documented, the ultimate, ultimate decision is documented, so then it can be demonstrated that you went through this process with all reasonable due care, um, you supported the resident and the um, client through the process, provided alternative solutions, and ultimately a conclusion was reached. Um, and that will go a long way from assisting with my insurance colleagues' concern <laughs> about um, risk and litigation. So finally, and just to conclude, and really to pick up the point that Anthony was making, I think that in advocating for the right balance, I believe if you have consumer engagement by sharing knowledge, information, and open and transparent communication, 
in collaboration with all relevant stakeholders observing privacy, to enable informed decision making, <coughs> coupled with excellence in clinical governance and capabilities in staff and the leadership team, to enable the conversation and to support problem solving and decision making of staff, then we will find a way to navigate this legal landscape and find the balance where the two duties can coalesce dignity of risk and duty of care. Thank you.